press and hold this button. This one? Yeah, press it. Am I pushing it? You hear it? Yeah. You, you see that blue light up? That's how you know the sound is coming through. You can hear <laughs> the sound. Do I just hold it down or? Yeah. Wow. You're making music. <laughs> I'm making music. <laughs> Isn't it epic? <laughs> it is. That's fun. Yeah, and then you just like turn some warp knobs and stuff. This is a, a button pusher dream. Literally. Yeah. I have dudes just nerd out for like an hour in front of my set sometimes. I'm like, hell yeah, brother. <laughs> it's great. That's so fun. Hi, welcome to Mycelium Gallery. I'm Elena, and this is Armand. Uh, he's our house DJ for Mycelium Gallery, and today we're having uh, Mycelium Sessions, and Armand is the master behind this. So, Armand, uh, your DJ name is DJ... Ex Machina. Ex Machina, and yes. can you tell me a little bit about what that name is? means yeah so pretty much it came to be whenever i was creating a sound that was both pretty but also very glitchy and i think from the movie ex machina i kind of got that feeling of from the machine like everything that i was creating was very from the machine and so i felt ne it necessary to kind of give it that uh that name just because Everything that I'm creating is literally from machines, machines like this yeah. or recording it out in in the wild, you know, just getting whatever textural sound and then being able to create it and put it into this project um, and then play it live for just, you know, just ambiance and textural purposes <laughs> without it being a main focus of, you know, like the night or whatever I'm doing, just creating things just from blips and just random stuff, Very honestly. ambient. Yeah, just to sound. kind of give it that feel. And then even putting it into cassettes, like that was the other thing when I started to create cassettes, um, that feeling of creating something so analog from a cassette tape and putting things on there and then replaying it on like a really old system Yeah. just gave me a feeling that I'm like, okay, yeah, this is very, very Ex Machina vibe. You yeah. Know? I just feel like I'm paying homage to the thing the, the very machine. thing yeah that created yeah. the sound you know yeah granted you know i have like a, a, a meat brain but <laughs> <laughs> taking the meat brain and putting it into this cool technological you know whatever i've got over here has been pretty exciting you're yeah. becoming part of the machine yeah i am the machine now <laughs> you are the machine i am the yes. machine i know the tapes are really what uh, something that drew me to you when we first met as well because growing up as a Gen Xer, of course, that was our our whole vibe was making mixtapes yeah. and different things like that, and that's definitely something that you like to do, and that I think that's really cool. A big big thrill. It was very there. fun, like just kind of getting into that whole scene. Because when I first learned about cassettes, uh, I mean, obviously I was a kid, but I didn't really pay much attention to it mm -hmm. until I started to actually create it myself. Yeah. Because the process in creating the art, creating the actual cassettes, and then recording it, and then creating the artwork for it. To me, that was more of like a meditative practice, and so I started doing it just to create yeah. a piece that I can put on my wall to actually see something physical that I've created. Because everything is digital, you know, yes. like you said. You know, it's like digital, and you know, everything is on the internet, or it's digital files and stuff, but not vinyl, not cassette, mm -hmm. not CDs. When I was a kid, I used to make CDs too. But creating the cassettes, that was a trip because even though nobody really listens to cassettes as often anymore, it was still like a huge niche in Oklahoma. And so I met a lot of people that started to get cassette players and things just because of that. Yeah. And it was it was awesome. That's honestly. really cool. Yeah. I mean, just to kind of get everybody back in that feeling. Um, they do things like Cassette Week here uh, to really celebrate that. And so... After I started doing it, I started to get a lot of attention towards just the product, you know, and because people enjoy this, but when you can put it 
into something that's tangible mm -hmm. people want that you it's know? true like i mean i even bought cassettes and i don't have a cassette player but i've been collecting your cassettes i appreciate because that. they're very artistic <laughs> i mean you also do the covers yes. and you put all your energy into that as art as well as the music itself it all goes hand in hand so to me i always feel as if art and creation there's like this end goal right so you start here and then there's like this end goal of where you want to be as an artist mm -hmm. and there is multi-level steps depending on whichever direction you go but in the end it all leads to the same place right yes and so when i create this this is only like one step towards the direction i want to go to but if i want to do another medium that's another step mm -hmm. so there's never a moment where i'm like okay i just need to do this i just need to do that to me the first thing that I think of when I pick up a medium, I always think, how can I incorporate this with my passion? Yeah. Right. And then I feed it into whatever I want to do. So if it's creating cassettes, doing the artwork, because I enjoy doing digital art, doing sketching. So I'll create the artwork for that. Even photography, you know, I'll take photos for some of my album art and I'll create the covers for it. And so to me, that's just my way of meditating and being able to create something so freeing like this, right, without any sort of structure. Um, I think that was one of the biggest things that I had trouble with as an artist was being so stuck in that frame, mm -hmm. that structure, without yeah. thinking outside of the box. Yeah. And then even being here at the gallery, that's what expanded my visual art even further. The inspiration that you get from looking at some of the artwork that's displayed here is insane. And knowing that those people are literally within miles around me is even yeah. crazier. And so taking the time to take the art in but also feed it back into this has been quite the process but it's been hella exciting i'll nice. say that so well tell me a little bit about like the genre and this <clears throat> this genre is like something you created it's called the dark lo-fi glitch yeah so when i first started producing this style of music so i've been producing for about 12 years now almost and i started this style about two years ago um, I, I came from the house and techno scene, so I was mm -hmm. doing a lot of the club stuff. Right. And that was just the high energy vibe. Like people wanted that high energy vibe and it's very structural. Like there was a certain way of doing it. And honestly, after I, really it was after COVID, um, everybody stopped going to shows and everybody needed to chill. And I took that time to really reflect and think of what kind of music I wanted to make for the next few years. Because if this was the future, you know, us being in lockdown and being stuck, then I needed to create something and pivot, right? Yes. And so sitting there one day, I was chilling, editing photos, and it dawned on me, I'm like, why couldn't I create a flavor of sound that I can enjoy on the regular? Not, not to be famous, not to, you know, show people my music, but for me to focus, mm -hmm. for me to do my thing yeah. and, my, and be within my creative space. Because if I can build a house, if I can build a room, if I can decorate the walls, if I can create the space that I reside in, just like music, then why couldn't I just create this never ending flavor? And so literally it was two years ago when I first started to produce lo-fi because there was a few artists that I really enjoyed and I started creating lo-fi music. And so I was like, okay, I like lo-fi and I sent out the music to a few labels and it was cool. I got some good feedback, but at the same time, there was a lot of rejection because of the sound, right? It was not um, fitting within the confines of what they wanted. Yeah. And so what I did was I ended up just saying screw it and saturated the market with just the same thing of what I wanted to create. And so when I first started producing lo-fi, it wasn't dark lo-fi glitch, right? So it just started off as lo-fi music, but as I started to produce more and more and then understand my sound, I started to enjoy the darker tones yes. a lot more. And so a lot of the sound that you hear is very dark, ominous, minor tone. And I play within that. I honestly don't produce anything in major key, uh, just for a fun fact, um, just because of the way that it sounds, it's too happy for me. And so I enjoy, my happy space is within that minor key or that the minor mm -hmm. scale, just like feeling that dark tone. And so that's where the dark part came. And then okay. the lo-fi, obviously with the lo-fi and the sampling, um, just the culture of lo-fi beats, I kind of took that and then just the, uh, the low fidelity vibe of that and brought it in with the dark sound.
So it's just dark lo-fi. And then eventually, as the sound progressed, I started to get into more glitchy tones. Yes. And now the glitchy tones, those don't really sit within the confines of lo-fi music. Right. It's just not what lo-fi music is about. It's more about dusty beats that are either boom bap, heavy drums, or something that's, you know, just got a hip hop vibe to it. Right. But I wasn't so fond of that sound um, just because it was very harsh on the ears and it was just either too sleepy or too harsh. And for me, I was like, okay, I want to sit within this range of sound where I can feel something, but also I can feel the textures of the sound where it actually gets me thinking, moving. I don't want to fall asleep to the music, you know, just because that's what it's for. I want somebody to be able to ride the wave of, of the sounds. And if they want to fall asleep to it, they can. And that's what I ended up doing. It was creating this dark lo-fi vibe with glitchy elements. Mm -hmm. And so then I started to saturate that sound. And so then I produced like four albums with that. And I just started to release it myself. Yeah. And that's where my label came oh, from. Oh, yeah. So that was what I was going to ask you about, too, was that you have your own uh, label called Distant Ether. Yes. And I wanted to know like how that came about for you as well. And honestly, it just came from rejection. Like that was the biggest thing that I realized is that I needed rejection in order to create what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, because if everybody gets what they want, you're never challenged to create something different. And when I look back at, at it now, I'm glad that the music got rejected because it gave me the balls to actually go out and do my own yeah. thing. And so after my first album or second, first and second album both got denied from labels because it was either too glitchy or not enough lo-fi or not sleepy enough, I was like, dude, screw this. And so I ended up creating Distant Ether as just a, just a project to get my music out there. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to you know, go through this whole process of like, hey, is my music good enough for your label? Rather, my music is good enough for myself. Yeah. And so that's when I started to release on Distant Ether. And I started taking it seriously after my l last two albums, really, because the traction was honestly unbelievable because the amount of people that wanted to put their music on the label, like submissions are still closed right now because I haven't opened it up to the public to actually submit music anymore. But just for me, I felt it necessary to be able to create a discography of this sound. So if I can produce over 200 songs, for example, with this style, then I have officially made my mark as a genre. And literally not even a year later, it became an official genre on Bandcamp. Nice. You know, and so it's That's like, really cool. yeah, I, I know, know right? right? I was like, yeah. what the heck? And it was really neat knowing that in the SEO, like search engine optimization for that genre was like at the top. And so when you see Dark Lo-Fi Glitch, you see like all of my music. Nice. You know? And I'm like, bro, that that is the way to do it. Yeah. Like, you know, just to kind of pave your own way and not care what other people think um, and just create what makes you feel good. And now, two years later, I've been creating things like texture tapes. That's not even really music, you know, but it's sounds and ambiance that you can put in the background and just listen. Things like this, just creating and just putting on something that sits within the background but not a focus has been really crazy because the way that it, the binaural sounds like, like really mess with your head yeah. in a good way, it really makes you feel some type of way does like I will say that Armand has a an old a really old cassette player in our gallery in our cave installation right now and you can play the texture tapes in there and um, we often play those and we that is definitely the music we play in here like we played a lot of Armand's music uh, while we were building and creating our immersive space and then Armand came in and created more music uh, because at one of our shows, 
you had a certain set, but you were having so much fun that you that, continued to create true. more music while you were here. And honestly, so, that was actually, I can't remember what show that was. I think that was the Gnome show. I think it was the Gnome the, show, the, yeah. The Rolling mm -hmm. at the Gnomies was when I had a longer set than usual, and I didn't know what to do for the last like hour. And I literally just winged it with ambient sounds and that's where the texture tapes came to be like nice because that, that first set i redid it and that's texture tapes one and two was that same set that i did just a winging set like from that show and so ever since then i've been doing like 20 30 minute 40 minute long and even last like last month we did a three and a half hour long texture yes. tape te technically yeah you know? and that was awesome because it was just it gives me a chance to not be so like on the beat, not so structured. You know, it's very freeing, like when you're painting, but this is almost like sound painting. It is sound painting. You know, I you, mean, that's why you call it textured. Exactly. So you are texturizing all the music, layering it on each other. And then that's really cool. And you're pushing buttons. Exactly. You just push buttons all day <laughs> and it's, it's super fun. <laughs> Well, thank you, Armand. Well, thank you for having me. I really yeah. appreciate it. I think you can catch Armand here um, every month. He has uh, what's called Mycelium Sessions, and you can check that out on our calendar on myceliumgallery.com. Thank you for listening to us today. Thank you. Thank you. Hooray. <laughs>